thank you so much everyone for joining us today to talk about bats in florida i'm really excited to share some of these little critters with you so let's go ahead and get started um, so what we're going to talk about today are some common bat myths some of the species that we have in florida their behavior um, what their habitat needs are and how that how we as uh, residents and visitors to florida can help conserve them. These are some common bat myths that Lara and I both receive. I get a lot of phone calls about this, especially when the rabies calls and the rabies newspaper articles start coming out. So the first myth is that bats suck human blood. And that is not true for any of Florida's bats, which is the most important part. In Florida, this is not true. Um, none of our bats are sanguivorous, which means they don't feed on blood, but there are about 1,200 species of bats worldwide and approximately three of them do feed on blood. This isn't usually an issue for humans. They tend to go after livestock, that sort of thing. They're primarily found in Central America and in the Southwest United States. They sometimes um, can be in those areas too. But in Florida, this is not something you need to worry about at all. So don't worry about it. Uh, the next one is that bats are a community rabies threat. You're probably familiar with a lot of articles that come out when rabies begins to be an issue in a certain community. And a lot of the species that people find with rabies are bats. And that is true. And the reason for that is bats don't act like a lot of other mammals do when they are infected with rabies. So you're familiar, most likely, with all of the rabies symptoms that other mammals like cats and foxes and dogs might have. The foaming at the mouth, the aggressive tendencies. Bats actually get disoriented and kind of sleepy. So you're more likely to see them in person than you would um, if they were healthy bats. So you might see them during the daytime or on the ground. And this is a sign that the bat you're seeing is ill. And so that's why our number one recommendation for coexisting with bats is never pick one up. If you find a bat outside during the day, especially, and it's crawling around on the ground, there's a good chance it's ill. And even if it's not rabies, it's not something that we want you to mess with. But it is thought, research suggests that less than one half of 1% of the bat population is thought to actually carry rabies. It's just we are more likely to test a bat for rabies because we're more likely to find it. So the, of the ones tested, they're more likely to have it. The next myth is that bats are flying rats. They're actually not very closely related to rats. Researchers believe they're more closely related to primates or dogs than to rats. But bats are mammals. Um, they are furry and they uh, do nurse their young like other mammals do. So we'll talk about that later. And then the most pervasive myth that we have is that bat roosts cause human disease. So bat colonies can cause human disease, but it is not something that most people need to worry about, especially in Florida. It's a very low risk of a um, disease called histoplasmosis. Now this is something that is often found in the droppings of bats. And so this would be a large colony, say in a cave or an abandoned building, and you'll have large quantities of guano, which is what we call bat droppings. When you breathe those in, uh, you can potentially get histoplasmosis. This is not something that you need to worry about so much in Florida because of the species of bats we have here, but we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into where our bats like to roost. So those are the most common bat myths, and now we're going to learn a little bit more about their biology. So for our bats in Florida, they're in the Caraoptera family. This is um, Latin for hand wing. So if you look at the wing of, on the left side of this animated bat, here, let me get the laser pointer out. If you look over here, what you'll see is actually very similar to the way our hands are made. So their little claw that they use to crawl around, that is most similar to our thumb. Then you have this first, second digit here, then you have your third digit, your fourth digit, and what makes up the biggest part of the wing is actually their little pinky finger. So it is most similar to a human hand 
when you compare it to a bird wing. So a bird wing does not have these digits that come out stretching the skin that forms their wing. This is the only mammal that has true flight, so it makes them very unique and amazing. And I am giving away a poll question here, but that is okay. So we have 13 resident species of bats in Florida, and we have three additional species that are occasionally seen in North Florida, and four that are seen in very, very South Florida. Um, they tend to come over from some of the islands in the Bahamas over there. So now we're gonna have a poll question that I just gave away the answer to. So the majority of you got it right, good job. Um, in Florida, there are 13 resident species of bats. So these are the 13 species of bats that we have in Florida. These are in Florida year round. They're not migratory and they stay here all the time. That's why we call them resident bat species. They're not all super common though. So what I've done is I've put a little icon next to each species. The green bats are our most common species. Our gray icons are our uncommon species. And then our especially rare species are highlighted in blue. And you'll notice that two of our bats, the gray bat and the Florida bonneted bat, have an additional icon that they are listed as endangered or imperiled. So these are species that are going to be very uncommon to see, very rare, and they both have limited ranges in the state of Florida. But we're going to learn a little bit more about where each species lives in a moment. I mentioned that we have several species that um, are occasional in North Florida and occasional in South Florida, and those species are um, listed right here for you. So we have three species that do come in to the very northern border from Georgia and Alabama occasionally. And then the South Florida species come over from some of the islands in the Bahamas and in that general region. Now what's interesting about the South Florida bats is you'll notice that they have flower or fruit or fig eating after their name. So these bats are pollinator species, which is a little bit different than our Florida bats. So what we're going to talk about now is we have that big long list of 13 species, but I get a lot of phone calls about, oh, I saw this cute little bat last night flying around by my house. Do you have any idea what it was? Bats are really challenging to identify from afar. There are only a couple that you might maybe be able to tell what they are if you get a picture from afar or if you are observing them in your backyard. But you can take a little bit of a hint based on where you're located, and if you see it come out of the roost, where it happens to be sleeping. So the species on your page right now, these are found all throughout the state, except for down in the Keys. And the reason this picture has different colors on it is some of our other bats are found in say a third of the state or two thirds of the state. So this is what we consider South Florida, Central Florida, and North Florida, and all six of the species listed here are found statewide except for the keys. Now these bats are only found in the northern part of the state. The gray bat, which is one of our um, endangered rare species, if you remember, is really only found in this small portion of the Florida panhandle. But these other bats are found in different sections of the state. So you've got your top one third of the state, your um, northern two-thirds of the state would be both of these sections. And then the eastern red is kind of right in the middle and north. The Raffinesque big-eared um, bat is really everywhere except very South Florida. So the northern three-quarters of the state. And then we have two bats that are only found in South Florida. And the first one is the Florida bonneted bat. If you can see on the screen, you've got little dots here that are hollow and then little black pixel dots. Now what happened here was um, we had a grad student and one of our research professors was doing research on where the Florida bonneted bat may be roosting. If you recall, the Florida bonneted bat is one of our endangered species in Florida. So what you've got here is a map of their different sampling locations and where the equipment picked up the presence of the Florida bonneted bat. 
So this bat is thought to be found in most of the coastal southern counties and additionally up into um, Polk and I believe that's Orange County. And that's very exciting because that's a, a wider range than originally thought for the bonneted bat. So that research is still ongoing and um, it's, it's really cool to pay attention to. The other bat that we have that's resident in Florida but only found in the very south Florida is the velvety free-tailed bat and it is found primarily in the Keys and over in the Dry Tortugas which is approximately here where my laser pointer is. So now we're going to talk about where bats like to roost. So if you recall, when we're trying to identify a bat, most of the time you can't identify them unless you have them in your hand, which we do not want you to do. Please do not pick up bats, especially if you find them on the ground and ill. If you recall, that might be um, from it being ill and having rabies. So please don't pick up any bats. Uh, but if you happen to have a bat in your hand or in a box, let's say you were catching one that got into your house, um, some of them you can identify by looking at them. But if you're finding them out in the wild, we have a large selection of bats that like to roost in trees and buildings. And so these are your bats that you're most likely to get in a bat house if you put one up in your backyard. The building roosting bats are the ones that might go and shimmy up those little crevices in the bat house. And as you can see, the majority of our bats in Florida do prefer trees and building roosting, which is compared to our bats, which roost in the caves. And so in our cave roosting bats, we have the gray, the southeastern, the raffinesque, the big-eared bat, which if you haven't guessed, is the one in the picture, super charismatic and adorable, and then the tri-colored bat. True or false, bats eat their body weight in mosquitoes every night. This super fun poll question, the majority of you are actually incorrect. So in Florida, the majority of our bats diets are not made up of mosquitoes. While it is true that they can eat their body weight in insects every night, they do not eat their body weight in mosquitoes every night. So most of our bats in Florida are nocturnal insectivores, which means that they are most active at night, like one would imagine a bat is, and that they are insectivores or they feed primarily on insects. In Florida, Florida bat uh, diets are moths, beetles, and flies for the most part. Mosquitoes are in that group, but they make up a very small portion of their diet. Now, a lot of people who call me and want to put in a bat house, they want to do it for mosquito control. So it's my obligation to let them know that they are likely to eat some mosquitoes, but if you're having a lot of mosquito problems in your, um, at your home or in your neighborhood, there are some other things that you should try before putting in a bat house if your goal is reducing the number of mosquitoes. Now, that's not to say that bats are not an important part of our ecosystem because they are very important to reducing the number of flying nighttime pests that we deal with in society. And so this goes beyond our annoyance with moths, beetles, or flies at night. And this really crosses over into being an agricultural benefit for our food system. So bats really provide a lot of benefit both to society and reducing our nighttime flying pests, which most people I talk to are pretty thrilled not to have things flying around at night. Um, but it also is an economic incentive to agriculture to help save our bats and make sure that habitat exists for them. Now, there is research that suggests that large numbers of bats or healthy bat populations can reduce the amount of flying insects in an area. And that is because we think that the insects are picking up on the bat chatter in the air and they're avoiding those areas that have a lot of foraging bats because just because a mosquito or an insect might not be the primary thing a bat is going after if it's in the area and a bat can catch it, it will. And the important thing to know is that all of our resident bats, so all 13 that are here year round, eat insects at night. And so even if it's not always mosquitoes, they are helping make our Florida evenings much more enjoyable. So now we're going to talk about behavior in some habitat. 
Um, in general, our bats in Florida will give birth in spring. Now mating actually usually occurs in the fall, um, but they delay implantation and they have their young in the springtime, usually in April. So the young will stay with the mother, um, feeding off of mother's milk until the bat is able to fly on its own and start foraging. So it usually takes about three weeks for a baby bat to learn how to fly and it will continue to feed on mother's milk for a little bit after that. But once they're able to successfully forage on their own, they will continue to do that. And that's usually in July or early August. Now our bats, um, oftentimes people ask how many little pups does each individual bat have? The major vast majority of our Florida species only have one or two pups a year or per mating season. But some of our large colonizing bats, the ones that do live in caves and you might have thousands of bats in a, in a colony, they can have two to four pups a year. And the second most common reason that people call after rabies for bats is how do I get a bat out of my house? So if you just remember, I said that bat maternity season is from April 15th to August 15th. So anytime outside of that April to August window, you can exclude bats. It is illegal to do a bat exclusion or harm bats in a home during maternity season. And it really makes sense if you think about it. So your mother bats and their baby bats, they're not all foraging every night. And so if you seal off a hole in your home, say, this little hole right here, if you were to cover that up and prevent bats from coming back into your home, you would have a lot of bats in your home that are trapped there. So you do not want to exclude bats during maternity season. For one, you will likely kill all the bats that are stuck in your home. But for another, it is illegal in the state of Florida. You cannot go out and kill all the bats that might be in your home. That is also not allowed. Exclusion recommendations are going to be site specific. As you can see on this home, they have a couple of areas that there are holes and a large crack likely in a soffit or the screening is pushed up in the soffit. And so they are using what's called is a net exclusion. Net excluders are a very popular way to exclude bats from homes. And what they do is they let bats leave, but the bat can't get back in. And we're gonna watch a short video on that in just a moment. After you install the exclusion device, you're going to want to wait at least four days. Because if you remember, not all bats leave the roost every single night. And you wanna make sure the temperature is where the lows are consistently above 50 degrees for the most effective bat exclusion. It would be really awful for you to go through all the trouble to put the bat excluders up and it'd be so cold that the bats don't leave, meaning that they're still in your home. So wait until it's kind of warm, make sure you're not in maternity season, and then you can use a bat excluder. And we're gonna watch a little video on this now. All right, so this is a bat called How to Get Bats Out of Your Building. As you can see, it's a joint venture between the University of Florida, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and Florida Bat Conservancy. You can find this on YouTube by, um, by searching for Florida Fish and Wildlife, How to Get Bats Out of the Building, and we will also include it in the follow-up email that you'll get. We want to uh, put netting over top of this hole so the bats can come out, but they can't get back in. So what we're gonna do is put the netting from here and drop it down about 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches down, so that they can crawl down or drop down underneath the netting, fly away, but when they come back, they'll try to get in where the hole is and they won't be able to get back in. So the screen can be fastened up. All right, so that's all we're going to watch there. But what I really wanted you to see was that section where the bats were trying to get back into the building. So that was an excluder that was working properly. And what it did is it allowed the bats to leave the building safely, crawl out past the net, but they just couldn't figure out how to get back in the house. Okay. Now, why might we want to be very careful with our bat population? And the reason for that is bats are declining nationwide. They're suffering a lot in our, in our country. They're a very valuable part of the ecosystem. I mentioned the agricultural benefits, but they also do help keep pest species under control. They redistribute nutrients through their guano. 
So when they eat a bunch of insects in an area that has a lot of them and then they fly back to their roost system and they leave their droppings behind, they're actually redistributing some of the nutrients in the ecosystem. But they have a lot of threats in Florida and nationwide. So the most abundant threat in Florida is going to be habitat loss or the destruction of their roosting sites. Um, another one is going to be disturbance, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, and then insecticides. So for habitat destruction, bats roosting areas are destroyed for a lot of reasons. The most dominant one is going to be that fear of rabies or other um, diseases that can be communicated to people. Another issue is going to be removing that habitat accidentally during landscaping work. Urban roosts or roosts in the middle of an urban center like a city, uh, those are quite often destroyed because they can be stinky areas. So if you have a very large bat colony living under a bridge in the middle of town, they're going to leave a lot of droppings behind. They're going to be quite stinky. So urban roosts are often destroyed because of that mess. And then if there is a rabies outbreak, it's just another bit of fear related to them. If bats are disturbed when they're trying to roost, they're sleeping all day. Uh, lights, noise, traffic, harassment, people throwing things up in their roosts, spraying them with pressure washers, all sorts of things like that. Um, they're going to need to relocate and find a new place. And if there's not a lot of habitat around because of the destruction of their roosting sites, it's gonna be a, a very stressful experience for them. And they might not be able to find a good spot to live. And then finally, broadcast insecticides are an issue because insects are their whole diet. So using broadcast insecticides, which means you're spraying a um, insecticide that targets a large number of species in a big area, those are going to be your most problematic insecticides. If you're using a very targeted insecticide in spot treating individual plants that need it, you'll have less of an impact on the bat population. So what can you do? There are a lot of things we can do. Uh, consider your bats when landscaping. You'll want to plant native species that attract non-pest insects in your yard. You can also plant native species that they might want to roost in. You can put up a bat house if you're interested and we will share a document in your follow-up email that has recommendations specific to Florida. And if you're going to use insecticide, please try to pick a targeted insecticide and only spot treat when needed. This is an example of a great Florida bat house. And what makes it so fantastic is that it's got multiple chambers. And I know you can't see it, but there are three chambers in each one of these boxes. And then having it back to back like this, there's actually a, a hole at the top that allows them to crawl back and forth between them. That's like an area that is warmer and drier than the area around it. So by having a roof and painting it a color that attracts some Florida sunlight, but certainly not all of it, um, will allow bats to self-select which chamber of the bat house is the appropriate temperature and humidity for them. Because it is Florida and it is super, super hot, these also do have ventilation holes on the side. So if you're going to purchase a bat house, you want to avoid the bat houses that are a single chamber. So the single chamber bat houses tend to be about a foot tall and they're very, very thin and they have one little channel for the bats to crawl up. In Florida, you really want to get a multi-chambered bat house and they're often quite large. So the ones that are most commonly recommended in Florida by our research documents are actually about um, two feet or two and a half feet tall and two feet wide, I mean, they're quite, they're quite big, and have at least three chambers. And really, the biggest thing that you can do as an individual who either lives in Florida or is interested in visiting Florida is helping to spread the word that they are really fascinating, important creatures in our ecosystems, and that with a little bit of effort, we can coexist with them and minimize disease, disease risk as well. So we have another poll question before we get into some more things you can do. Which of the following is a roosting spot that is popular among Florida's resident bat species? 
Your options are snags or standing dead trees, Spanish moss, palm fronds, or all of them. So most of you got the question right, uh, but the answer is all of the above. So when you are landscaping your home, or if you are talking with people who work on municipal parks, these are some things that you can do to preserve bat habitat in your community. You want to leave old palm fronds on the tree. It can be very popular to remove the dead brown fronds from trees such as the cabbage palm or state tree. Those brown fronds are very popular roosting sites. And as you can see in this picture on the right, individual bats will roost in the green and the brown fronds on a standing palm tree. So it can be very aesthetically pleasing to some people to remove all that dead branch off of the palm tree, but that is quite often a very popular spot for our bats to roost in. Um, something that acts like that on your back porch might be a patio umbrella. So just be careful if you've recently removed a lot of palm fronds, you might find a bat or two in your patio umbrella. Um, another very common place for our bats to roost is in Spanish moss. So again, this is something that people will remove occasionally for aesthetically pleasing purposes. So they'll pull all the Spanish moss off their trees and that's bat habitat. That's where they like to roost. Uh, Spanish moss most of the time is not causing any damage to our trees, especially our large oak trees. Um, it is not a problem for that tree. If there is an overabundance of Spanish moss on a tree, it's often the case that the tree has some other issue that is allowing the Spanish moss to take advantage of it. So taking off the moss isn't going to solve the tree's problem anyway. And snags or standing deadwood are fantastic habitat for bats when it is safe to leave them. Now, please don't leave a standing tree, you know, in the middle of a kid's playground. But if it's in an area where there's not sidewalks or if it's off in a natural area, there's really no need to remove snags. They provide wonderful habitat for bats and insects and other birds, songbirds, owls, all kinds of great things live in our standing dead trees. And then live trees that have holes or cavities are also great for our cavity roosters. So in conclusion, we have 13 species of resident bats in Florida. We are their biggest threat, and that is mostly through the destruction of their habitat and roosting sites, often because of our fear of disease. Rabies and other diseases from bats are extremely low risk in Florida, but if you see a bat, please do not pick it up. This, is, this person is holding a Florida bonneted bat, one of our endangered species. And this is a researcher, so he has the proper permitting to do so. Um, but this is what our adorable bonneted bat looks like. As you can see from this picture, he's about fist sized. And this is one of our larger species in the state. I believe it's actually the largest species of resident bat in Florida. In general, bats are fantastic and valuable members of our ecosystem. And one thing that we can do to help protect them is spread the word about how cool they are and all the benefits that they provide to us. So with that, Lara, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and for listening to our presentation on bats. We have some fantastic resources.